All right, let's jump right into this because uh, I don't know how much time I have today, but we'll we'll see how far we get. A uh, lot to discuss on this particular topic. As you all know, I did a video the other day uh, talking about this particular topic and how Matt Dinalhunty was using these terms. Now, I do have a minor correction. Uh, I will correct my own stuff. Uh, I had actually said in that video that Smith had not used those terms that particular way. Um, I actually had Mart, Bull Martin, Bullivant, and Smith but come to find out, rereading uh, Smith's literature, which was pop philosophy, uh, he did actually use those things that way. So I stand correct on that. Smith did use these terms very atypically from what I've read in, in the literature regarding specifically these types of terminologies. Uh, to give you kind of a background, Smith was, um, he was a philosopher of sorts, but he, it's questionable what actual academics uh, he had when it came to philosophy. Uh, he was an Anne Randian objectivist and more of a pop philosophy kind of guy, more of an armchair philosophy kind of guy, it seems. Uh, when he wrote his book, a K Atheism, A Case Against God, he had already dropped out of college. Uh, and so it was kind of like just... Yeah, I mean, straight up pop philosophy that I think a lot of the new atheists have latched on to as something as normative. I think that's exactly what Matt Dillahunty has done. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure he's read uh, Atheism Against uh, Case Against God, but that was in 1974. And, um, you know, we've come a long way in modern uh, epistemology, right? Mon modern contemporary f and analytical philosophy. So why they use such an outdated and antiquated and never really accepted usages to me seems just... It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense that they would read all this non-philosophical, you know, accredited or peer-reviewed stuff and take it as, like, absolute. Uh, it's kind of like reading Dianetics and think that's, you know, psychology. It's, it's, to me, it's the same thing. I don't see any difference, you know. If you're going to read a pop science book, do you think that that science is actually what is going to be held to as rigorous in the scientific community? No. So why would philosophy any be any different? I don't think it should be any different. But anyways, uh, let's get started here real quick. Uh, make sure you all can hear me out there. Uh, probably won't have a lot listening to this because, again, uh, this is a topic that most people find very tedious. Uh, I don't. I think it's actually um, critical when it comes to critical analysis of how people utilize things that they read. And especially when they read things that are just, yeah, like I said, just, you know, pop stuff rather than go read the literature because I never see D Dillahunty actually talk about the literature. He never references any papers. He never references, I think, Oppie or Draper or any of them, but everything he times kind of spews comes straight out of what you would find in these pop psych philosophy books. Uh, things like, um, you know, A Case Against God or David Silverman's Fighting God or even Boulevard uh, Handbook for Creating Atheism. You know, it's it's just... It's untenable to me. But, but uh, going back to my, my video the other day, normally when you hear terms like implicit or explicit, they tend to mean what you think they mean, right? If I explicitly say something, then I am saying, like, for example, God does not exist, right? That's explicit. I'm making it very clear that I hold the position that there are no gods rather than implicit where I'm not expressly stating something. So that's how implicit and explicit are, are generally used. However... Smith, for some bizarre reason, um, used it that way seemingly, seemingly in his book and also used it a little bit different relating to a conscious rejection. And he means non-acceptance. He doesn't mean rejection as in false. He means non-acceptance. So he divides this down and waters it down to some really weird thing to say, okay, you have all these things in the universe that do not have a belief in God. Okay, and of those, you, I'm going to separate them into the things that are consciously aware of the proposition and things that are not consciously aware of the proposition. So the things that are not consciously aware of the proposition have never evaluated the proposition. They've never looked at it. They don't know what it is. Uh, you might refer to them as innocence. That's what Oppie refers to them as. Uh, or just, you know, an adult that has never heard of the proposition God exists before. So, they, so he divides these into what he calls implicit atheist. He further divides it into what would be explicit atheism, which is somebody who does have a conscious awareness and has attempted to evaluate the proposition, but has failed to do so. This would include um, agnostics. This would include um, uh, 
strong atheist, which is going to be a subset we'll get to, but is something that has a conscious ability to evaluate. Now, again, this isn't inherently wrong, right? I'm not saying that this doesn't work, but there are some issues with it that we'll clearly see. And yes, Matt Dillahunty was still wrong. Uh, he, made, he made a statement that I went over in the last video that um, he said, weak and strong atheism are in the realm of explicit atheism. Well, you can look at the Euler diagram here. That's what this is, it's not a Venn, it's an Euler diagram. You can look at it and see that's not correct. Okay, uh, this is straight from Wiki. And again, Wiki is a horrible source for a lot of this stuff. If you want to learn philosophy, I can tell you right now, Wiki is crap. If you go to talk Wiki on the pages and, and see how people even brought up, there's many, many issues with a lot of the atheist stuff. And I think that was all, all because people had been editing Wiki, Wiki and uh, nobody actually wanted to formalize it and nothing, nothing was actually put on it that made any coherent sense to me. But if you look at the Euler diagram here, there's a group of people that are aware of the proposition and that have explicitly said that God does not exist. And we generally refer to them, if you want to use weak and strong designations, which I eschew, but I don't, whatever. But if you want to use them, then that would be a strong atheist. So looking at the Euler diagram, you can see you have two subdivisions of weak atheism. Weak atheism is this superset in the superset of weak atheism, you have division of implicit atheism, those or things that have not heard of or been consciously made aware of or evaluated the proposition. And you have the, the implicit set, which, and these are going to be a, a contradiction to each other. You're either in one set or the other, right? That's that hard line in between, right? You can, you can either be an implicit or an explicit. You cannot be in both. And I, yeah, you can't be in neither either. Either you have heard of the proposition or you have not. If you have have not heard of the proposition, you're implicit. If you have heard of it, you're explicit. And if you have heard of it and evaluated it, you're strong. Again, using this Euler diagram, which I, I hate, but whatever. We're, we're, we're working with this. So, yes, strong atheism is always going to be a subset of explicit. That part Matt is correct on. But he also said weak atheism is a subset of explicit in his realm. His wording is in the realm of explicit. Well, no, it's not. If you look at the Euler diagram, weak atheism is the superset. Therefore, it cannot be the subset of explicit or implicit, right? So it would be make sense to say strong atheism is in the realm of explicit. Explicit and implicit is in the realm of weak atheism. Weak atheism is the superset. Now, I tried to kind of rearrange this into a different kind of uh, format for an Euler diagram. And so, you're, so if you're aware, the difference between an Euler diagram and a Venn diagram is that an Euler diagram relates properties. It relates relationships to things. It doesn't necessarily have to do with logical relationships. But Venn does logical relationships. So like the mccray Noel venn diagram that we have, that shows logical relationships between strong and weak atheism and agnosticism. But the Euler diagram doesn't really care about the logical implications as much as the relationships of the sets. Uh, Kimawaki says, while Martin's view of Smith's book doesn't really quarrel with his word usage, but the substantive, substantial criticisms of Smith's arguments against the existence of God is pretty instructive. Yes, I have his criticism here. We'll get into that, too. Michael Martin did review his book. He had some issues with it. Michael Martin was a person who advocated for negative atheism, although not very strongly, um, which is kind of ironic because... In his book, Negative Atheism, Michael Martin advocates that all lack theists, well, he doesn't call them lack theists, obviously, but all negative atheists have a burden of proof, something that Matt Dillahunty says is impossible. <laughs> so, right? so, so here's a guy that actually advocates, that writes books on negative atheism that says, yes, if you're going to hold to the position that you are undecided and that you just merely lack a belief, that needs to be justified to be a rational position or reason to hold uh of suspending judgment is basically what it is right we've already determined that weak atheism weak theism and narcissism are the same logical position i don't think anybody in my live chat will disagree with that any longer that has been proven multiple different ways by logic uh so if you you know if you argue that agnostics have a burden of proof which they do then it follows that weak atheist or lack theist have a burden of proof as well so when matt dillahunty says that it's impossible for weak atheist or impossible for those who just merely do not believe god exists to, to have a burden of proof he's just fundamentally wrong um ozzy's explained to this to him a million times other people explained to him a million times he's just fundamentally wrong he, he really just doesn't understand i think conceptually the different types of burden of proof in epistemology and he's just fixated on onus probandi which is more of a legal sense of the term 
or in the sense of evidentialism or science uh, types of approaches when it comes to burn of proof. But he, he completely neglects any kind of um, epistemic burn of proof or discursory burn of proof. So he just doesn't think they exist, I think. I mean, it's just bizarre. I mean, if I, again, tell you that I do not accept your claim and we're having a discussion, then, of course, I have a discursory burden of proof to explain to you why. But Matt doesn't think that's a burden of proof. O okay, but, yeah, every other person I've ever talked to that talks about epistemology and philosophy sure the hell does. So, again, I, I don't know how you eliminate these burdens. Um, just by fiat, Matt says it's impossible because he's like, well, what do I have to do, prove to you that I lack a belief? No, Matt. That's not what it is. A burden of proof does not mean you have to prove anything. This has been well established. The only time you have a burden of proof to prove something is when you say, I can prove something. I can prove 0 0.99 equals 0 0.999 repeating equals 1. I can prove that. Do I have an onus to do it? Yeah, only if I want to convince you. Then it's called a burden of persuasion. Right? I have no onus to, to show you that I can prove it. If I, I can just tell you and you can believe it or me or don't believe me, but I don't care one way or the other if you believe me or not. You know I can. I've done it, but whatever. So, you know, he, Matt is still fundamentally wrong in this, that when he said that weak and strong atheism is in the realm of explicit. Now, again, you can go watch the video on that. It was from an uh, atheist experience not too long ago. I'm not going to link it. I don't care. Believe me, don't believe me, but that's what he said. So uh, I came up with a little different type of diagram. So this is the diagram that I kind of came up with. And yes, I'm not a diagram person so if, if somebody has more creative talent than i have that wants to like take this and kind of pretty it up um i'll, I'll give you some credit somewhere down the line <laughs> i'll be like you know artistry by you know kimamaki artistry by desire hansen or something um but because again i'm just really about the concepts right so see if you guys can follow along with this and, and let me know what you guys think if this uh just assimilates what was already on wiki which again is confusing and i'm going to dive more into that shortly but relates in a way that's a little more visual because that euler diagram is just crap i think it just doesn't yes it's simple don't get me wrong and yes by looking at it i can understand what they're trying to explain but when you read the legend for that thing it is it is way off from what the picture in the in the um and the entry talks about and i'll get into that it just it doesn't make any sense the way to describe it and I'll show you why and see what you guys think. But I start off, okay, so in the superset, which would be in the yellow there, you have not BP, which is going to be weak atheism, right? It's going to be the position that you do not believe God exists. This is what Matt Delahunty and Aaron Ra advocates is atheism. We all know that he's, they're full of crap on that, but whatever, that's not, not the point of the video. But let's go with their framework. Let's go with a... Um, uh, internal critique, so to speak, of, of their of their usage of these terms, which they think for some strange reason is normative and, and all throughout philosophy and whatever. Although now I think they're kind of realizing that's not true, but they still put it out as, oh, you must be theist or atheist nonsense. Um, so, so in the superset, you have does not believe God exists. Now, in that superset, you have the implicit atheist, now, I didn't put it in any other uh, set. I just put it in the yellow set because if you draw a line from the not BP to the not BP, not B, um, and what I call A for accept, I'm just, again, I just made this predicate up. Don't go looking for it. Um, you're allowed to do that. You, you can make stuff up if you explain it because, again, this is for illustrative purposes. So I just came up with the predicate of accept. So if you're an implicit atheist, you do not accept P because you're not aware of P. You're not consciously aware of P. And you do not believe. That would, to me, give you the properties of an implicit atheist. Someone, or something, because again, Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Ra believe that rocks are atheist, which is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in, in atheology. And I'm sorry, but if you listen to somebody who thinks atheist um, or rocks are atheist, you're not listening to somebody who's promoting good philosophy. You're not listening to somebody who's promoting good epistemology. You're not listening to somebody who is even trying to make sense of these things. Because if I was an atheist and I believe there are no gods, I would be mortified to put, be in the same set of, of rocks. Hey, hey, that rock and you have something in common. You, you know, you both, you know, lack of belief God exists or so what, you know, but, but to, a, to a strong atheist, I'd be like, no, I, I, I believe there are no gods. I'm not, I don't want the same label as that rock. Why would I want to be a neighbor? No, that makes no sense. I'm an atheist. I'm just hypothetically here. Uh, I, I'm an atheist who believes there are no gods. 
I don't want the same term as somebody who merely doesn't have a belief either way, right? There needs to be a division there. There's only so much of the space to go around. In the epistemological space, right, you have the people that believe, true. You have the people that believe false, which is disbelief. And then you have people that believe neither. That's the, that's the epistemological space. Now, you can add in people that believe both, but we obviously know that is a contradiction, at least an epistemic comp- contradiction. And so we find that to be irrational. It's not logically impossible. You could, in theory, believe something true and false at the same time. It's called c- cognitive dissonance or some kind of dial theism. But rationally speaking, there's only three divisions of the epistemic space. Believes the proposition true. Believes the proposition false, which is called disbelief P, or have no position either way. This is how it's divided. And to, to, to subsume a sublate uh, a- agnostic into atheism is just straight up dishonest. So, so, so far, does this diagram work for you? Um, does anybody see any problems with the implicit side? And again, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much specificities between accept and, and um, consider. Let's just assume arguendo that they're just interchangeable here. They're, they're synonymous, right? Um, if you, um, or actually may not accept, aware, right? If you're aware of the proposition, you've consciously evaluated it. If you're not aware of the proposition, you have not consciously aware, uh, may evaluated it. Simple as that, right? We'll keep it very simple. So that's the implicit side. Now, in the weak theism, you have the purple, right? And in the purple, you have uh, the people that are aware of the proposition. And the people that are aware of the proposition can be two types. It can be the person who does not believe and the person who d- does believe there's no gods. So in the purple, you have the explicit weak atheist. And again, this is gonna be Smith's terminology. I really detest this term- terminology, but this is what Matt was talking about. So in fairness to Matt, when he was talking about this, this was the utilization of the terms that he was using from Smith's Atheism, A Case Against God, which, again, is pop philosophy. This is, again, why I wasn't too familiar with it. Even though I've read that book ages ago, it had been a long time, so I apologize. That was Mia Copa. Uh, I, I, I just had not remembered terms like explicit weak atheism. They're just nonsensical to me. So my brain just brain farted them out because they're just so stupid. But, Matt, uh, if he's using Smith's usages, then yes. But that's so atypical. You, I don't, you don't find these things anywhere in the literature. I don't find anything of the sort for that in the literature other than pop philosophy. But let's go with it from Matt's reasoning here, right? Because again, I think he's I think he's aware it's not normative. I, I mean, I like to believe so, but who the hell knows? But he is certainly putting it out as normative. He's saying these are the way things are. No, Matt, it's not. Again, it's like a Scientologist trying to say that Dianetics is the way things is. It's like some kind of cult putting forth their own dogma, their own ideological beliefs, rather than what you actually find almost ubiquitously in the academic literature. And I find that to be absolutely intellectually dishonest, right? Because if you're going to teach something about a subject and you don't even have a basic understanding, you're going to run into these problems. Now, I'm no expert, but I I like to think I have a basic understanding of this particular niche of epistemology. Right? And it might be very, very basic, but that's all you really need. Very, very basic. And go read the literature and go, hey, yeah, I'm not finding this, Matt, what you're, what you're, you're saying to be in concordance to what the literature says. Matter of fact, this is exactly the same approach that I took with Wayne Fillmore when I did my debate with him on evolutionary theory, on macroevolution. I said, basically, you know, what you're, you're, you're espousing there is not in concordance with academic literature go look macroevolution is out there he's like well macroevolution doesn't exist really well here's some papers on it here's some you know things you can read on it go look and in the literature he found yes macroevolution does exist it is something that has been described and observed and he's like wow maybe the younger creationists have lied to me which they did and he left younger creationism and i think the exact same thing applies here matt dillahunty and arm are lying to people on the philosophies they're just completely lying to the people and i'm sorry to say that because again i like arn Matt, he could take a long rock off a short pier for all I care about. But, you know, Arn I happen to like. And I think Arn just doesn't know better. I think Matt probably does, but doesn't care. I think it's all about his ego. I think it's all about promoting of his particular brand of atheism uh, and his dogmatic and rigid approach. It has nothing to do with any kind of philosophical coherence or it has nothing to do with any kind of uh, 
being able to critically think and use logic and reason has nothing to do with that. He doesn't care about any of that stuff. He just cares that you adopt his his approach because he wants to get people to donate to the AXP. That's it. It's all about politics, politics, politics. <laughs> it's all about politics um, and, and, and fundraising. That's all it is to him. But I don't care about that. I care about rigor because I think his approach just makes no sense. All right. So in the purple, you have the group of people that have considered the proposition. Of those, you have the people that do not believe God exists, but are aware. Now, as a subset of that, you have the people that are aware of the proposition, which is going to be AP, and you have the people that actually believe the proposition is false, right? So that's explicit, strong atheist. The person who believes there are no God falls under explicit atheist because they are aware of the proposition and considered it, and they believe that it's false, which I put this little straight line down to, to show that because this is all, the conjunctions are, tra are transitive, right? So and, and commutative. So I can I can move the, the the brackets around as much as I want because these are conjunctions. We also know that strong atheism implies weak atheism. We also know that B not P implies not B not P right? Not B P, which just basically means if you believe the proposition false, you don't believe it true. It's simple as that. That's what the little arrow implies, right? It's a it's a subalternation. So. Because you believe that those God, there is no gods, that implies you don't believe and you are aware of the proposition. So this is how Smith is, is defining these terms. And this is what Matt Delahunty is trying to relate to people. Okay, that's fine. But he doesn't relate that this is pop philosophy. He doesn't relate that this is not how it is, uh, you know, generally speaking, in philosophy, which I think is disingenuous. But moreover, he is wrong when he says that weak atheism and weak, uh, weak, the, weak atheism and strong atheism are in the realm of explicit. That cannot be. That is just simply wrong. Strong atheism, yes. But weak, no. Weak, and think about this. Every one of these uh, squares has weak theism in it, right? It all have not BP. It's in the red, it's in the purple, it's in the yellow. Not BP is the superset. Basic set they will tell you that if the superset is larger, it cannot be a subset of any smaller set. Right? All animals are wolves. All wolves are animals. Right? But not all animals are, are dogs. Right? Animals is the largest set. If animals is the largest set and out of, some animals are dogs or wolves and some of those wolves have to be dogs, then dogs is a smaller set. That would be equivalent here to the strong. Well, wolves would be equivalent to the weak, uh, and then animals would be equivalent. No, no I'm sorry. Uh, uh, here, here, um, dogs would be equivalent to explicit strong atheism. Wolves be equivalent to explicit weak atheism, and then animals would be weak atheism, because animals is the largest set. So, if animals is the largest set, then how can it be a subset of dogs? Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need the views. Yeah, because I, yeah, because I care about the views. Exactly. I do this for views, everyone. It, yeah. No, I do it because I want people to actually learn this properly. And Matt Dillahunty keeps getting stuff wrong. Uh, it doesn't give me any more views. I may only have twenty-two people watching. So yeah, I don't think that's going to be working there, angry atheist. But uh, you know, good, good try, good try. Give you, give you, give you an A for effort there. But maybe pay attention to what's actually being explained, and maybe you can kind of converse with us and learn something. Like, when you look at the diagram, would you agree that not BP is the superset? And if not BP is the superset, how is it then, then a subset of the explicit atheism? So when Matt Dillon, he says that weak and strong atheism, and you don't even have to look at this diagram. You can look at the Euler, other Euler diagram. If, if uh, strong atheism is a subset of explicit, which it is, uh, and weak atheism is a subset um well, actually, implicit, uh, implicit atheism and explicit atheism are a subset of weak, and then strong is a, is a subset of explicit. How is it that, that weak atheism and, and strong atheism are subsets of explicit, according to uh, Matt? I mean, defend Matt here. I'm curious. Because Matt said that weak and strong atheism are, su or he said realm, in the realm of explicit. But we're going to give up a little bit of principle of charity and assume that he means subset. So can you explain to us how weak and strong atheism are subsets of explicit using this Euler diagram? Would you like to try that? Yeah, let me know.
All right, so let's go. Let's go into some of the stuff here that I've kind of found on the on the relationship to this. Now, uh, this is this is a case against God. This is a uh, like I said, 1974, uh, written by uh, George Smith, George A. Smith. Ham I think it's Hamil Hamilton Smith. Uh, like I said, he wasn't much really of a professional philosopher as much as he was a writer. Um, if you read real quick, um, Atheism Against the Case Against God by Michael Martin, who was a philosopher, he actually really does kind of give some critical analysis to it. And he says, there's another point that should be made that any that, that may unjustly, I believe, make some philosophers, teachers hesitate to use the book. According to information provided on the back cover, Smith studied philosophy at the University of Arizona, but it's unclear how much formal training in philosophy he has had. One, he dropped out of University of Arizona before he wrote this book. So he didn't even finish his degree when he wrote this book. He has, however, been greatly influenced by Anne Rand and Nathaniel Brandon. Rand and Brandon are cited and quoted more frequently in the book than anyone else. And on the back of cover, Smith is billed as a student of libertarian point of view and co-author of the Libertarian Periodical. In other words, he was political. This was written to be a political book, not a philosophy book. Big difference. And he's also an Anne Randian objectivist, which is considered by most philosophers to be kind of pop philosophy. Now, again, you have some hardcore people out there uh, that think otherwise, but generally speaking, if you go ask the average professional philosopher, they're not going to be too, too, um, too happy with Randian objectivism. They don't really think that's philosophy. Um, there are some issues with it, uh, but it's, it's almost like a cult in some ways. Um, if you really talk to an objectivist, it has a very strict um, uses of terms. They have their own language, and if you disagree with them, you're you're basically a um, subversive person. Uh, you're basically what they call a uh, not a reprobate, but a um, something similar to that. You're basically a negativist. That's what they call you, a negativist. Uh, if you disagree with them, and so. Even if you can show they're wrong, you're still a negativist. Uh, even in math, I had shown a few of them wrong on math, and I was a negativist because I showed them that their math was wrong. <laughs> but whatever. Um, it is what it is. But yeah, that's so... So there's some issues. and I'm, I'm not trying to to say there's a, uh, you know, like anything like a genetic fallacy here. I'm not saying, well, because, you know, he didn't have any formal training, he, he wasn't right. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying is that it is very clear that he was not a professional, in my opinion, philosopher. Um, and so when you write a book like this, it, you have to, to realize it is for the lay audience. It is for, uh, popular, uh, philosophy. It is for the people to, to make people, become non-believers in order for for demographic purposes and matter of fact there's another book out there called a manual for creating atheists by P peter bogosian which is exactly that and and peter bogosian just butchers i think atheology and i think he's just absolutely fundamentally butchers it and he does so just for political reasons that's all um, he just wants to make more atheists he doesn't care how um yeah right one second gotta Got to do something real quick. Uh, one second. I've lost my chat here. Let's, where are we? All right, give me give me one second here. I'm gonna fix this because I don't see the chat. There we go. I got it back. All right. My apologies. Um, Momo Jack says, how many, much money would you take to have a conversion conversation with Matt Dillon over this topic? I would do it for free. But Matt Dillon, well, here's the problem. Okay. Um, I got personal issues with Matt that I would have to overcome that I find to be very difficult to overcome because I, again, it's personal with Matt because he had, um, he had a, uh, uh, supported a person who screwed over the community, a person who stole $60,000, a person who beat up his boyfriend. This is something that I just, I, I can't really get past. Um, so, and, but Matt has made it very clear that he has no intention of ever talking to me on this topic. Cause that's fine. Arn, yeah, I would. But again, Arn is just adamant about these things. He's just by fiat. I don't think he really understands the topic very well, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would actually enjoy a conversation with Arn if he wasn't so obstinate. But Matt would be a different story because, again, I got personal reasons against him. 
But yeah, so this is Michael Martin's review, and I think Josiah Hansen had mentioned this, so that's that that was very true. He must have already looked at that. So, but this is his book, A Case Against God, and he starts off with theism as defined as a belief in God or gods. Okay, well, that's generally speaking. Again, I don't like prescriptive definitions. Uh, I think things are defined by usages, but we're talking about in the domain of discourse and philosophy and academia, not by the common person. Yes, sure, words can be used and, and defined descriptively by common usage. That's called general parlance, but I'm not interested in general parlance because if you use general parlance in some kind of specific domain of discourse, it's not gonna make any sense, right? If you're a medical professional and you start using general parlance understanding of words when it comes to um, reading a medical paper or working at a hospital, you're gonna have a bad day. They're gonna look at you like you're an idiot, right? Same thing with any domain, like like physics, right? For like physics, um, there's a there's a there's a there's a specific definition of heat, right? And heat is defined, and this is prescriptively defined, not just descriptively. This is prescriptively defined. That heat is the transfer of thermal energy from a higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, and it must always be in motion. In other words, you cannot have stored heat. So heat is defined to be that motion, that heat transfer between an area of higher thermal concentration to lower thermal concentration. That is how it's prescriptively defined in physics. But in the general sense, in the colloquial sense, heat isn't defined that way. Heat just means warm, right? So if I say to, my, if I say to myself, hey, man, this, this house really retains heat, to a general person, you know, they're going to be like, yeah, it just means it, it stays hot, right? But to a physicist, they're going to look at you like that's nonsensical. That makes no sense. A house cannot retain heat because heat must be in motion. It must flow. The heat must flow. And so these words that have a specific uses in a domain of discourse is not going to be the same as how the general layperson or general parlance usage is going to be. So Matt is trying to use like heat as in general parlance would just say this house can re house really retains heat and trying to make it normative. This is the analogy, right? I'm not ever saying that he's actually arguing about heat, but this is the analogy. He's taking a general parlance word and then trying to make it normative for everybody, not explaining that in the actual academic literature and the domain of discourse, that's not how it's used. This is why I find Matt Dillahunt to be dishonest. Because he's using these words and trying to explain to people how, you know, how he thinks they should be used, but not explaining to them, you will never use these words like that in academia, or at least very, very, very seldom, and they would be for very specific reasons. But if you go to a, a, to a physics class and you start talking about stored heat, any, any physicist with his, his salt is going to say, no, you have a conceptual error. So I think that Matt has a conceptual error, but moreover, uh, even if he doesn't have a conceptual error, he's just doing it to be dishonest. It, it's still something that needs to be called out. All right. So theism generally is defined as a belief in God. Okay, again, descriptively. Uh, the term theism is sometimes used to designate a belief in a particular kind of God. That's true. That's called classical theism, the personal God of monotheism. But as, but as used throughout this book, theism signifies the belief in any God or number of gods. And that's called global atheism. And again, I have no issue with that. That's how I uh, talk about these terms. When I talk about theism, I do so in the non-classical sense, meaning any God, at least one God exists. I'm not talking about the monotheistic or the God of Jacob, Isaac, of Abraham, or the, the Christian God, or the you know, Yahweh, or the Muslim God, or the Jew God, the Jew God, Jewish God. Uh, I'm not talking about that specifically, right? That is just one type of God. If that particular God exists, theism is true. But if Thor exists, theism is true at least the way I'm using these terms when I write about this topic. Momo says, yes, well, Kai was pretty manipulative. Even you would agree with that. Yes, I would. It doesn't make sense to forgive some people for Kyle's manipulations, other than not, uh, others, not unless it's something more than that. But Momo Jack, now that we know that we know, has Matt Dillahunty ever apologized? Answer that question. He goes, uh, so Smith goes on to say the prefix A means without. So A, atheism literally means without theism or without believing gods. That actually isn't true. Now, 
A can mean without, but it didn't mean, see, but again, this is where you have to get into the nuances of these terms. And if you really want to dive into this, go read on my blog um, uh, about the changing definition of the word atheism and usage by Josiah Hansen. He has a really good um, piece that I put on my blog on this. But it wasn't without gods as in um, does not believe. What it was more signifying was that an atheist was somebody specifically the initial usage was a Christian that was denied favor of the Roman pantheonic god, pantheonic gods. In other words, they were without favor of the gods. So when they would say without gods, it means that God, the gods did not favor them or give them anything because the Christians were leaving them to go worship this monotheistic being. And so they were atheists in that sense. That's how it originally came about. It wasn't belief in no gods. I don't think they even thought that would, I mean, people at that time probably didn't even, you know, think that it was even reasonable to believe there was no gods. It was just kind of a given at the time. But the term atheist referred to uh, to without um, favor of the gods rather than just not believing, right? It wasn't a self-referential thing to an epistemic disposition of belief. It was external, meaning that it was without the gods. The gods did not have anything to do with these people because they had left the them for this monotheistic being so it wasn't epistemic um and so when you say literally means well not necessarily so i mean it could mean not as well right because there's no specificities on the greek alpha prerogative of the of the letter a that 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 letter a doesn't necessarily mean literally without it could mean literally with not or, or excuse me not which means negation so the term atheism literally means without theism. No, no, this is absolutely wrong. Because what Smith did here, and again, this is a pop philosophy book. This is not something you find in the academic literature, um, or at least not of any consideration. There are people that have argued this, but it's not normative. It is very atypical. And, and Draper in SEP points this out. This is, he even says this is divert, it call, he says something along the lines of departing even more radically from the norm. This is way departing radically, way departing very radically from the norm. It's atheism. It's not without theism, right? It is. It would be interpreted as, um, in this case, without a belief of theism, but more specifically, um, without the favor of the gods, rather than without belief in, in, in gods or gods. Because if atheism means without belief in gods or gods, then yes, that assumes agnostics and assumes innocence. Which is he's trying to argue, right? He's trying to argue that implicit and explicit atheist would be without belief in God. But that's not what the A is negating. The A is actually not, and it negates the proposition of theism. It's without the proposition of theism. It's, it's saying that the proposition of theism is false. The negation is always on the proposition here, not the predication. So it doesn't mean without theism, you know? What it means is that if you have a proposition then for every proposition, you have a negation of that proposition. And atheism is represented as the negation, as the not, as the negation of the proposition theism. So he are, he's arguing this, but again, this is what he's trying to argue, but does it make sense to do so? No. And most philosophers did not take this very seriously. But unfortunately, Matt isn't a philosopher. Um, Mojo, no, Matt Delaney hasn't, and neither has a lot of other people, multiple random people that believe Kyle, but they don't have the same audience Matt has. You give almost everyone a pass for Kyle being manipulative except for more well-known people like Matt Delaney, because he is more well-known. He has a bigger audience. He, cha he, he basically, you know, smeared me and to a lot of people. I think that requires a public apology, right? He's not some rando. So yes, Matt Delahunty... Never gave me an apology. Um, never corrected a mistake. So yeah, it's not the same thing. Kimaki says, therefore, in a sentence about what atheism is, seems pretty prescriptive to me. No, uh, no basis, but he's the boss, I guess. Yeah, this is really prescribing things, right? I mean, it, it, it at least is written in a prescriptive language. Whether Smith was trying to prescribe it or not, I can't tell, but it is written in a very prescriptive language. Right, but he's trying to relate it as this is what it is in philosophy. He's really he's writing this as hey, this is how it's understood, this is what it means. No, it's not. No, it's not. Momo, it's because he has a wider audience. He has a very wide audience, and 
why would I have a conversation with somebody who had a very white audience that disparaged me and literally got it wrong? So yes, he owes me an apology. Uh, <clears throat> Atheism is sometimes defined as the belief that there is no God of any kind. Well, sure, because that's what it is. Or the claim that God cannot exist. I don't think I've ever seen that, to be honest with you. I don't recall anywhere in the literature where atheism is defined, and again, I hate to use the word defined, because to me, uh, these are prescriptive things. But there are times to, to define things, and I get it. I mean, on my paper, I use defined as well. But you have to be very careful, because you don't want it to come across as being descript or as prescriptive. But I, I don't particularly recall anywhere where atheism is the claim that God cannot exist. That's dealing with a modal aspect. Right? When you're dealing with these elaic modalities of possibilities and impossibilities, that's adding in another parameter, another property. And I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think that that would be beneficial. If you want to argue that gods are impossible, sure, go for it. I don't think that has a name. But does that entail atheism? Yes. But is that atheism? No. Because if for being an atheist, you don't have to make the claim that God cannot exist. It's just the claim that there isn't a God. So why would you therefore make it even more stringent of what an atheist would be by adding this, this extraneous uh, property of impossible to it. That seems, seems ridiculous to me that, that somebody would do that. But again, if you claim that gods are impossible, then yes, that entails atheism. While these categories of atheism do not exhaust the meaning of atheism, they are somewhat misleading with respect to the basic nature of atheism. Really? And he says, atheism in its basic form is not a belief. It is the absence of belief. Why? Who says so? This is not how it is in the academic literature. Right? This would be no different than me saying theism in its basic form is not a belief. Uh, God exists. It is the absence of the belief that God does not exist. It's the same thing. If you if you if you apply it to one, you got to apply it to the other. Why is it that you're that you're asserting that atheism is a mere absence of belief? There's no reason for this. This is again a model that is just generally not accepted in philosophy. And if you read SEP, Draper gives very good reasons why it's not accepted. There's multiple different reasons why it's not accepted, but I'll put that in a different video. And he says, atheism, uh, an atheist is not primarily a person who believes that a God does not exist. Yes, it is. That's, that's what it's used for in the literature. Rather, he does not believe the existence of God. Now, you see what Smith's trying to do here. Now, again, this was 1974 when he wrote this. This was two years after Flew wrote his paper, The Presumption of Atheism. This was a big push to change the way people thought of the word atheist. Matter of fact, Flew in his paper even says that he understood that atheism is generally the, the state of somebody who believes there are no gods. But he wanted to be thought in the negative. He wanted to be thought of somebody who does not believe in the existence of God. This was his argument. This is the whole argument behind the paper, The Presumption of Atheism, that he wrote in 1972. Smith was just building upon that. But again, this is pop philosophy. I cannot emphasize that enough. This book is not... A, a, a peer-reviewed book. This book is not that accepted by mainstream philosophers. As a matter of fact, I only know probably one that would, and that would be Bullivant or Boghossian. Okay, two. So Boghossian would and Bullivant. They're the only two modern, extant, contemporary philosophers that I can think of that would probably agree with this. And Bullivant happens to be a theist. And Boghossian happens to be a, a, a more of a, a philosopher of social sciences. Right? He's very good at that. But in doing so, I think that he, and I hate to say it, dishonestly approaches atheism. Because if you read, and I have it here somewhere, if you read his handbook for creating atheism, he puts forth the same nonsense. Uh, but again, it's not how, if you go take a course in these, in these subjects, it's not going to be used that way. Um, Kimo said, I wonder if Smith wanted to rush this book to publication to match his, his just wagon to Flew's silly presumption paper. Yeah, probably. I would think so. Now, again, uh, neither Flew nor um, Smith nor Martin are alive any longer. Smith died a few, di a few years ago. I think he died in 2020, um, which wasn't that long ago, matter of fact. Um, I thought he died before that, so I, but I know Martin Flew passed away quite a while ago. Bullivant is still living, but again, he's a theist. Bogosian, I'd love to have a chat with him one day, but and it may be possible because again, I, I I got an ends with uh, atheist for freedom or atheist for liberty, so um, we'll see. But 
Continuing on, he says, as here defined, the term atheist has a wider scope than the meaning usually attached to it. The two most common usages. The two most common usages are described by Paul Edwards as follows. The first, there is a familiar sense in which a person is an atheist if he contains there is no God, where this is to be taken that God exists is expressed false, a false as Paul position. Yes, that's a common usage in philosophy. Second, there's also a broader sense in a person is an atheist if he rejects belief in God, regardless of whether the rejection is based on a view that belief in the God is false. But the problem is, is that rejection is understood as believing false. So it's ambiguous when you use the word rejection, uh, in this way, because you're just saying not acceptance, which is not the same thing. But if you look, he even admits that is the common usage, right? That the expression of atheism is to relate to somebody that it, the God exists proposition expresses a false proposition. Now, he was on to say, both of these meanings are kind of important of atheism, but neither does justice to atheism in its wider sense. Atheism is a privative term, a term of negation, which again is the negation of the proposition, not of the predication. As a substitute for theism, we see that as negation of no God, belief in God, or in other words, atheism. No, this is where Smith makes a fundamental mistake. This is where people have promulgated this mistake for decades. The negation of not, as Draper poignantly points out in, in, in Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the negation is not of the predication of belief, but is of the proposition. So when you say negation of theism, it's not saying somebody who doesn't believe God exists. It's saying somebody who believes the proposition is false. Big difference. Uh, Jeremy Nolan says, in my college philosophy class, atheism was you don't believe in any gods, not just um, you lack a belief. Well, that's actually the same thing. I think you mean in your philosophy class, atheism was the belief that God does not exist because don't believe in any gods and lack of belief are synonymous, right? They're interchangeable. Now, granted, Dillahunty does not like the phrase lack of belief because he thinks that it imparts some kind of um, meaning that you're lacking something that you need. Whether you agree with that or disagree with that, that's fine. I don't care one way or another. Um, I don't take it that way, so I'm fine to say lack of belief. But if somebody wants to say, well, I don't like to use the term lack of belief because it kind of connotes that I'm missing something. And I can get that. I can understand that. If you want to go with that, knock yourself out. I don't have a dog in that fight, so I don't have any you know, uh, rejoinder for that when it comes to that, when when Matt Delhunty doesn't want to use that phrase. But, uh, but I'm fine with it personally, so... Mackie said, when I read, read Bogosian's handbook, I recall thinking it was a political manifesto with few useful philosophical ideas. I, that's exactly what it is. I have it here, and we'll get into that. I have it in a tab, Maki, and that's exactly what it is. It is a political manifesto. It is not a philosophical treatise. Same with this. This is a, um, a case against God, and uh, finding God by Silverman are political. Matter of fact, it's funny, Kimo Maki. Think of the name of this book. A case against God. God. It's not a case for indecision. It's not a case for agnosticism. It's not a case for undecided. It's not a case for I do not believe either way. It is not a case for I don't believe God exists. It is a case against God. This is what was confusing to me before when I was thinking about this with Smith because I had read this book before. And, and in some places it seems to me that he's arguing there is no God when he gets into the, like, the arguments against theism. But he, the name of the book is a case, it's a case against God. It's not a case for indecision. I, I, so it seems to be, you know, kind of a incongruent there, to say the least. All right. Um, so he goes on to say, um, theism and atheism are descriptive terms. They describe the presence or absence of God belief. Well, sort of. I mean, theism describes the position of somebody who does not believe that God doesn't exist. It describes that, right? That is a description. If I say, um, Steve does not believe that God does not exist, that's a true statement. That describes my position. But it doesn't make me a theist. Any more than saying that does not believe God exists describes an atheist, but does not entail and it necessary, makes it necessary to be an atheist. Or it doesn't meet the sufficiency condition, I should say. Because if somebody says they don't believe in God exists, I have no idea if they're atheist or not. 
because I don't use terms like that. I don't use the term atheism that way to being just a lack of belief. And, and neither do philosophers for the most part. If you, read, if you read a book on atheism in philosophy or paper, it's going to be in the positive epistemic status. It's going to be in that, that positive state. So if you used Smith's usages here and go read a paper, it's not going to make any sense to you in context. And I guarantee it. Go do it. Go read some papers. Um, and they go on to say that um, in this context, theism and atheism exhaust all possible alternatives to, of, with regard to belief in God. One is either a theist or an atheist. There's no other choice. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. Now, sure, using his usages, yeah, so what? But if I say theist and dog exhaust all possibilities, you're either a theist or a dog, I'm just creating this artificial dichotomy. Because he's just arbitrarily saying if one accepts, does not accept the proposition is true, that is atheism. But that's not philosophically sound. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually just say it's philosophically naive and wrong. And there's reasons why I can actually argue that it's, it's wrong. But just accept that he's just arbitrarily labeling the position of does not believe atheist. That's it. That's all he's doing. He's taking non-theism and changing that word to atheism. That's all that's going on with Smith's argument. That's all the flu does. That's all what Matt Delahunty does. That's all the Aaron Ra does. They just take that term, non-theist, and they just, boom, make it atheist. That's it, which is dishonest. Because you could do the exact same thing and take the term non-atheist um, and make it a theist. So if you don't believe God doesn't exist, you're a theist. Same thing. If you do one, you got to be able to do it for the other. That's the, the weak atheist special pleading argument, right? Um, so he says there's no third option or middle ground. Well, sure. There's no middle ground that one believes or one does not believe. Sure, we all agree upon that. But this is where it completely goes off the rail. He says, uh, which has been traditionally offered as a third alternative to, uh, says, this immediately raises the question of agnosticism, which has traditionally been offered as a third alternative to theism and atheism, because it is not the way you're using these terms, but traditionally and still in modern epistemology. Right? And he goes on to talk about how the, the I'm not going to go too much more into this because i got other things I want to get to, but he goes into how Huxley, and go read, go read this, you can go find it on Google Books, but he goes into how Huxley created the term, um, uh, and he talks about gnosis, but actually, more specifically, according to Flint, in the book of Gnosticism, 1903, uh, Huxley actually used the term gnos, and G-O-N-S, or nos, um, and it meant to represent the illusion of having knowledge. In other words, Huxley himself came with the term agnosticism as a neologism to represent his position because he, he considered himself um, a, a, a quote a fox without a, a fox without a tail and he didn't have an is to his position i s t so an agnostic or agnosticism um, was a position that he came up with to say look I don't have a position either way but he's, he developed it as a normative epistemic principle that no one should believe God exists or no one should believe that God does not exist because the insufficient warrant to do so. Neither the theist nor atheist, in his opinion, were justified to hold their dosaxic position, or to even, nor to even hold their epistemic knowledge positions. So, to Huxley, if somebody says, I know God exists, he thought they were just out to lunch. Or if somebody says, I know God does not exist, he thought the same thing. But he also thought, felt that neither theist nor atheist could make even a claim to belief. So in other words, he was neither a theist nor an atheist. This was the whole point. So for Smith to come around and say, oh, you, you must be one or the other, that's just wrong. That just really undermines exactly what uh, Huxley was trying to explain. That no, you don't have to be one or the other. Um, and so when, when he, go, when he go, it says down here, um, uh, let's see here. He says, the term agnostic does not in itself indicate whether or not a person believes in God. Agnosticism could either be a theistic or atheistic. No, it can't, not in the ontological realm. Agnosticism in modern philosophy is a psychological state of being agnostic, where you have no position either way. It has nothing to do with knowledge. As, no, as Graham Oppie said, is no more closer to the atheism than it is to theism. And he gets into agnostic theists and agnostic atheists, which I'm not going to get into. Um, I, I do want to find where he starts talking about explicit. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, he, he does point out that according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, the agnostic is not an atheist. An atheist denies the existence of God. An agnostic, profess, agnostic professes ignorance about his existence. For example, for the latter, God may exist, but reason, 
can either prove or disprove it. Now, I happen to agree with that, I mean, generally speaking. Uh, this would describe, um, generally speaking, an agnostic, right? Um, but he says, notice agnosticism emerges as a third alternative only if agnosticism is narrowly defined as the denial of atheism. Or excuse me, the denial of theism. Yes, absolutely. That's what we're talking about. And notice, notice that even Smith uses denial of theism to mean the belief that God does not exist. It merely is not just mere rejection or non-acceptance, I should say. Right? When Smith says, is narrowly defined as denial of theism, denial is understood in the literature as the assertion that it's false. Not this n mere non-acceptance. So if I say I deny P, that means I believe P is false. Okay? With P is the proposition God exists. So that, I think that's pretty important because... Even, even Smith used the term denial the way I do and, and every philosopher I've ever read uses denial. Um, so he says, we have seen, however, that, that atheism in its wider sense refers basically to the absence of uh, belief in God and need not in detail the denial of God. Okay, well, that part that it doesn't entail, that is actually true. If you, if, you, if you have an absence of belief in God, that does not entail the denial of God. That absolutely is true. Weak atheism does not entail strong atheism but strong atheism does entail weak atheism right the denial of god does entail a lack of belief in god but again he's just trying to prescribe atheism in the in the in the broad sense rather than the narrow sense i use it in the narrow sense as does any i think rational atheist or philosopher um so he says, thus previously indicated agnosticism is not an independent position or middle way between theism and atheism because it classifies accordingly to different criteria. This is the talking point that new atheists use. This is where they get it from. Right? You can hear atheists parrot this all the time because some uh, more popular atheists read this or read something similar to it or have read some derivative of this and says, oh, hey, Steve, athe agnosticism is not a middle way between theism and atheism. Well, BS. Okay, Smith is just wrong on this. Because what Smith is trying to do is prescriptively just redefine atheism in the, in, the, in the broadest sense and say, oh, look, I have believe or not believe. If you not believe, you're an atheist. And therefore, there is no agnostic third position. But that is dishonest. That is carving up the, the epistemic space dishonestly. What they're trying to do is get two positions out of one. Because think about that. In the rational epistemic space, a belief, disbelief, and suspend judgment. Those are three very different, mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive positions if somebody is aware of the proposition. You can believe the proposition true, you can disbelieve the proposition true, which means believe that it's false, or you can suspend judgment. By the way, Matt Dizalhunty has gotten that wrong before. He thinks disbelieve just means to not believe. That is not how it's used in the literature, not how it's used in epistemology, that's not how it's used in anywhere I've ever seen, but he's using the colloquial understanding of disbelief, which is more like you see a car accident and you stare in disbelief that it happened. You refuse to believe, you have an inability to, refuse to believe. That's just one sense of the word in general parlance. But again, we're not using words in general parlance, we're using the word disbelief as it's understood in epistemic logic. And again, go back to the heat. If Matt Dillahunty says this house retain heat, retains heat in general parlance, that we know what it connotes. We, we know that he's trying to say that, yes, it, stay, it stays hot in this house. But to a physicist, that is a nonsensical statement. I don't know why anybody would have rigor for physics, but they wouldn't have the same rigor for philosophy. If you're going to be rigorous and want to be considered a critical thinker and want to be considered to be a rational agent, if you have rigor in the domain of discourse of physics, why would you not have rigor in philosophy and other subjects? So the disbelief is understood as believing something false. So in that event space of these three positions, of believing P, disbelief P, and suspending judgment, they're trying to say that Disbelief P and suspending judgment are both atheist. So now out of those three positions, two of them are atheist. They're dishonestly carving up the what I'm going to be referring to as, I just call it the epistemic event space or epistemic space, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's not truly an event space because it's not doing probabilities, but eh, whatever. We we'll just call it the epistemic space. That's dishonest. You can't do that. Why? Because they're very different positions. 
One position is that you don't have a belief either way. You literally are just undecided. And the other ones, you've made a decision. It's, it's false. Why would you want that to have the same name? In fact, all you atheists out there that believe there is no gods, why would you want the same name for somebody who just merely lacks a belief? They don't have the same position you have. They're not asserting there are no gods. Why would you want that to be the same? You, you don't. You don't want me as an atheist. I don't have that position. I'm an agnostic. That should be cool with you, by the way, because we're both non-believers, right? That should be totally cool with you. Matter of fact, most people leaving theism don't all of a sudden come out and say there are no gods. They have a transition period, and many of them go through that agnostic phase. Matter of fact, Ozzy went through that agnostic phase. He was he was a fundamental um, Christian. He was a he was a Jehovah Witness even. He was a young Earth creationist, but then he started falling away, and then he went through the agnostic phase of you know. Maybe he just didn't have a position either way. Maybe he, you know, he didn't have any convictions any longer of God exists. But he wasn't so far um, convinced that God didn't exist. He ha was an agnostic. And then now he believes there are no gods, right? So it is helpful to have that third position as a transition. Why atheists want to remove it, I think it's counterproductive to their goals. It harms atheism. Because you're, now you're not allowing a person to have that transition period. You want them instantly to jump from theist to that, that term agnostic because you're trying to normalize atheism. At least you're trying to normalize the, the word atheist, which I'm all for. I, I agree with you. Let's do it. I want to normalize atheism too and, and normalize the term. But that is not how you go about it. You don't try normalizing the term atheism by being dishonest to people. That doesn't help your argument. No. Uh. All right, so he's just, it just, he's just by fiat carving up the event space, or something, carving up the epistemic space by saying, look, if you're not a theist, you're an atheist. And, and this is, again, where you, you find all these atheists out there spewing this. But when you ask them where is this in the literature, they, they, you won't find it. But it's the same token as if you ask somebody about pop philosophy, well, where do you find this in the literature? Well, it's in this book by Dr. Oz. Well, who cares? You know? Dr. Oz is not a, a, a psychologist, you know? It's pop stuff. <laughs> I mean, you have to be able to differentiate between good philosophy and bad philosophy. This is bad philosophy. This book is bad philosophy. Like I said, I read it eons ago, and I thought it was horrifying. It was bad. All right. Um... Excuse me, let's see here. See, it's agnostic is a legitimate philosophical position, but not a third alternative, a halfway house between theism and atheism. Yes, it is. And you can demonstrate this on, a, on using logic or in a, a landscape. Put atheism on one end, where you have a person who believes there are no gods, you have agnostic in the middle, then you have theism on the belief that God does exist. And he acknowledges this. He says, look, agnostic exists on the, on the narrow version, which I use. Okay, then why, then why do you need the broad sense? Why do you want to eliminate the position? It makes no sense because, again, as somebody who's undecided, I don't want to be in the same category as atheists who have decided. We're different positions. But you, you can see how an, uh, uh, a lay atheist would read this and go, oh, look, I'm going to take this as fact. I'm going to take this as, oh, this is how it is. Po mean, poopy Steve, you know, is wrong. Well, no, I'm not. Um, so he gets it goes further and he says, atheism may, and by the way, this is where I kind of forgot. So again, mea culpa, um, I want to make that apology. Um, when I said that Smith didn't use it this way on my last video, Smith did use it. My bad. Um, at the same token, again, it's been a while since I've read this book. But now, but I did go back and reread read some of this. So I understood what Matt was trying to say, but Matt was still wrong. So yes, I had an error in my analysis. I'm happy to admit that. I correct my mistakes. But Matt was still wrong. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> even with my error, Matt was still wrong. Um, but atheism may divide, is divided into two broad categories, implicit and explicit. Okay, so again, this goes back to um, the, the, the image here. Um, let's see if I can pull this up here. Uh, yeah, so that right here, I'm just going to put it over here, so uh, I'll leave it there, so um, <clears throat> that's the image there, see, so he's dividing it up into implicit and explicit atheism, and he goes on to say, implicit atheism is the absence of theistic belief without a conscious rejection of it, which again includes rocks, not just people, 
Not just people, because I think Smith even realized that this is set theory. You could further divide it into people. S has to be some kind of agent capable of evaluation and comprehension and consideration. But in the broadest sense of the set, in the superset, it is all things that lack a belief. You cannot just hand wave that away, right? So in the universal set, you have, we're going to call it set A. And in that set A, you have all things that um, believe God exists. We're going to call that theism. In the complementary set, which is everything that's not in set A, you have a prime. That would include everything that is not in set A. Not just people, but everything. It's all inclusive in that U universal set. So if universal set is A with a complementary set of A prime, A and A prime literally encompasses everything in the universe because that's the universal set. Then you can start getting subsets from there and say, okay, in the A prime set of all things that lack of belief, I have people. But you cannot just arbitrarily hand wave that away. So implicit atheism by category, by set theory, would include everything that doesn't believe in God, including rocks. And this is why Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Ra believe rocks are atheists. Which is again, one of the dumbest things imaginable. I am sorry, people, but if you're an atheist and you let somebody run this argument that rocks are atheists, you are you're just you're just dumbing down atheists. You're making atheism look stupid. Stop it. Just stop it. Get help. Stop it. Get help. You need help. It's stupid. It's dumb. It's it's just absurd. Now, is it coherent as far as or I should I wouldn't say it's coherent. Is it consistent with their usages? Yes. It is actually logically consistent. Right? It is just Absurd, though. It's just absurd to think that a rock would be an atheist, epistemically speaking, rationally speaking. Right? But it is logically the case that, yes, rocks would be an atheist according to Smith's usages. But why would you want to? Why would you want to use usages that make rocks atheists? That's just dumb. And also, atoms are atheists, and quarks are atheists. Dogs are atheists. My chair is an atheist. It's stupid. It waters down and axiologically devalues the term atheist. No, we want atheists to be someone who's capable of, of rational comprehension that um, has d denied the existence of God. That's why it makes more sense to have atheism as that position. Atheism is, is, is held as the position there are no gods. Because you can more define it that way. And I hate to say prescriptively, but yes, it would make more sense to do it that way. You're not, you're not violating any set theory there, right? Because in that particular case, you have all things that believe God doesn't exist, atheists, and then you have the, the complementary set that all things that do not believe God exists. Does not exist, I'm sorry. Which would be fine, because in that case, you have atheism and non-atheism. Rocks are non-atheist, sure. You have theist, not atheist. Rocks are non-theist, sure. I got no problem with that, because it's just set theory. You can't get out of that. Right? So theism contains all the things that believe that God exists. In the complementary set, you have all things that exist that do not have that belief, which would be non-theist. Okay, that's just a function of set theory. You know, if you say, hey, does my chair believe in God? Oh, should be, no, okay, then it's not a theist. Well, correct, it's not a theist because it doesn't believe God exists. Now, if you want to label that non-theist, that's fine, it's a semantic game at that point. You know, it's, just, it's semantics. Do, do, do you want to call it a non-theist or don't? I don't particularly care. It's semantical. Should non-theism be reserved for the term, at least, for people? Yeah, probably. Probably, because it is a semantic thing. You're just saying not a theist, and you're going to call that the word non-theist. Whatever. But, but it, it doesn't really matter, because, again, that's semantics. But it's still with not a theist. Just like if you're an have the set of atheists of all things that believe there are no gods, the complementary set of things that do not believe there are no gods, which is everything else. And if you want to call that non-atheist, yeah, that's what it is. Not, or at least it's not an atheist. It's just semantically non-atheist, but it is still not an atheist. You know? So in that particular case, a rock is not a theist, and it's not an atheist. What is that? Isn't that a better way to go? Does it make more sense to, 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 to atheists out there that want to be rational and not look like an idiot to theist? 
Would you rather adopt a schema that has been universally accepted in philosophy as, hey, is your rock a theist? No. Is your rock an atheist? No. Okay, that makes sense. Is your rock an agnostic? No. Why? Because it has a suspended judgment. Now, people may be aware that there was a there was a dishonest lawyer years ago that edited one of my one of my uh, statements and trying to make it appear that I argued that rocks were agnostic, something I've never ever 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 done. But I was doing an internal critique of somebody else's argument, explaining you, their model that was what would happen logically. But of course. They didn't, they didn't care that I was doing an internal critique um, and dishonestly try to say Steve has promoted the idea that rocks are agnostic. I have never done that. I'm not an idiot. In order to be agnostic, you have to be able to suspend judgment. So rocks are non-atheist, non-theist, and non-agnostics. They're rocks. All right. So moving on. He says, explicit atheism is the absence of theistic belief due to a conscious rejection of it. Again, rejection is understood as the belief... Something's false, but he's using it as non-accept, which is problematic in itself. But again, pop philosophy, right? He's not going for any academic rigor here. An implicit atheist is a person who does not believe in any god, um, but has. And again, notice he's trying to now make it into a person, although it wouldn't follow from set theory. But he, now he's trying to do narrow that down, which is at least an attempt, but it, it doesn't get you out of the set theory problem. An implicit atheist is a person who does not believe in a God, but has not explicitly rejected or denied the truth of theism. Now, see, he's saying explicitly rejected. And that, to me, is being understood as holding the position false. But that's just rejected. Implicit atheism is not required familiarity with the idea of God. Again, Oppie would have called this innocent. Um... For example, a person who has no knowledge of the theistic belief does not believe in a god, nor does he deny the existence of his being. Denial presupposes something to deny. Well, that's true. And one cannot deny the truth of theism without first knowing what theism is. Okay, now he's using knowledge here not as the epistemic sense. Keep that in mind. He's just using knowledge as explicit knowledge, right? Not as the understanding of knowledge in the epistemic sense of justified true belief. He just means aware of. Right? When he says, knowing what theism is, it just means you can substitute aware of. It's just being aware of the, of the proposition. Until he's introduced to this idea or thinks of it himself, he is unable to affirm or deny its truth or even to suspend his judgment, which is agnostic. <laughs> just like he goes, he's on before saying there's no third position of agnostic, yet here he's like talking about to suspend judgment, which is agnostic. All right, so that's all I want to go on as far as here, because again, he does he does go into the explicit atheism and explicit um, uh, strong atheism and explicit, explicit weak atheism, which again makes no sense to me. Uh, I, I just don't understand how anybody would want to use such terminologies. Uh, I mean, because again, it, uh, strong explicit atheism, it's just atheism. You know, why, why add all these other adjectives to it? These modifiers, they don't modify anything. Like, example, what is the difference between strong, explicit atheism, which is, again, a phrase that just makes me nauseous, but what's the difference between strong, explicit atheism and just atheism in the philosophical sense? If atheism is the position that there is no God, if atheism is, is, is held... As the belief there's no God, then why would you want all these other words that added to it? It's superfluous. It adds nothing. It doesn't modify anything. You just have atheism. Atheism belief that God doesn't exist. Okay, great. Why do we need this, all this other stuff? It doesn't, it doesn't break down the epistemic space in any rational means that requires breaking down. Right? I mean, if you want to break down the, 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 the epistemic space to those who have an absence of belief because they've not had awareness of it, just call it innocent like Oppie does. You don't need implicit or explicit. You can get rid of all that. You don't need any of that. You just have strong, you, I mean, you just have atheism, the belief that God does not exist. Theism, the belief that God does exist. Agnostic suspends judgment. And then, separate of that, you have the innocents, which have not been made aware of the, of the proposition. So the atheist, the theist, and the, and the agnostic have all been made aware. There, that's so much simpler. Why add all this convoluted terminology? That just it just it just makes no sense to me. 
It's not parsimonious. You're, 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 you're literally here to me violating Occam's razor by, by, by unnecessarily multiplying um, entities. You don't need them. You, you, just, you just don't need them. All right, so moving on here. Um, so if you go to Rational Wiki, uh, not my favorite site, obviously. Uh, Rational Wiki is nowhere near peer-reviewed. Um, they, this, but again, this is what some atheists go to, right? They think that Rational Wiki is actually a legit place for finding out stuff about philosophy. Hint, it is not. It is not. Rational Wiki is a conservative page. It has nothing to do with actual philosophy. Okay? So the atheism from the Greek A meaning without and theos meaning God is the absence of belief in the existence of God. That's pretty prescriptive. You know, they give a citation, Atheism by e Nelson Encyclopedia Britannica, which is not what exactly what it says, which we'll get into there. But they're just, by fiat saying this, that is not correct. That's just not correct. Right? I mean, it's, again, if you read Cambridge or if you read Stanford, it is expressly said, A does not mean without here. It means not as a negation. So this goes against academic standards, this goes against a normative understanding. This is, again is to promote idealism, or excuse me, not idealism, ideology, ide ideology, idealism, <laughs> promote ideology and dogmatism, that's it. These are biased sources, right? This is what I'm saying, when atheists want to say they're rational thinkers and then they use biased sources like rational wiki, um, and I'm not saying that everything is rational wiki is bad, I mean, they get some things right, obviously, I mean, it's not like, always wrong but it's just not something you should take as normative um all right so uh real quick uh, the manual for creating atheists by peter bogosian right um he says the confusion is understandable even that the word atheist is contained in the word atheist yeah um thus it is natural to assume a type of parallelism between the two of words yes do you have the proposition god exists and the other proposition, God does not exist. They're coextensive. If you have one, you must have the other. So it is natural to assume there's a parallelism. Why not? Why would you, why would you not? Many of the faithful imagine that just as the theist firmly believes in God, an atheist firmly disbelieves in God. Well, that's what it, it doesn't necessarily mean firmly, but yeah, it's just disbelief God exists. Um... And again, notice he is using disbelief to mean the belief that God does not exist, right? He's meaning disbelief to mean belief false. So he's using it that way. The, this, and, so do, and by the way, so does American Atheist. American Atheist uses it that way too. But if you go to my blog and you look up Matt Dillahunty disbelief, Matt Dillahunty tells a caller that he's not using disbelief properly. He's saying, no, disbelief just means you don't believe. And the caller's like, no, Matt, that's not how it's used in philosophy, literature, um, in logic, um, in epistemology. And Matt's like, by fiat, saying, oh, you're just wrong. Well, I got tons of citations on my page to show that Matt is incorrect, and the caller was right. Um, and even Peter Grove goes in, is using it as believes God doesn't exist. This definitional and conceptual confusion needs to be clarified. Okay. Atheist, as I, notice, and he says very clearly, as I use the term in italicies. This is very, very, very telling. He is distancing himself. This is distancing speech, right? You know, in philosophy or psychology, when you distance yourself from something, you start talking about it from a separate point of view and a third party point of view, from a, you separate yourself, right? You know, so he's distancing himself. And saying, I, as I use the term. Well, I don't give a crap how you use the term, Peter. Now, again, I like Peter Pergosian from his, his advocacy of social stuff. He's really good as a social philosopher. I mean, very, very good. He knows his stuff. He's very, very, very smart. I've watched some of his videos, and I happen to like what he has to say. But on this particular issue, I think he's being dishonest. <clears throat> but he says, as I use the term means there's insufficient evidence to warrant belief in a divine supernatural creator of the universe. However, if I was shown sufficient evidence to warrant belief in such an, evidence, an entity, then I would believe. Wow, what a mouthful. He's, he, I'm supposed to get all that from how you use the term atheist. 
If you did not tell me that, how the hell would I know how you're using the term and why would he want to use the term so atypically and so stipulatively? Plus, it really doesn't make sense to use it this way. One, most people, if given sufficient evidence, would change their position. Most, if rational agent. Again, we are, we are applying the rational man standard. Not somebody who's intransigent, not somebody who just will not ever change the position. We're not talking about those types of people. They recuse themselves from the dialogue. Most people have what's called open-mindedness, which is a virtue in virtue epistemology. So, does it really make sense to add anything like, oh, well, given sufficient reason um, to warrant such a belief, I would change my position, I would believe. Well, yeah, that's kind of something any rational agent should say, right? You don't need to say that. You don't need to add that. Why does it need to be a part of being an atheist? Why are you adding in this... this virtuous open-mindedness to the term atheist when atheism deals with an ontological claim, not an epistemological one. You guys, you guys follow me here? Why would you want to add this into atheism? Atheism is a position on the ontological status of God. It has nothing to do with whether you're going to change the position or not. Somebody could say, look, I'm an atheist uh, and I will not ever change my position because there is no God. That could be done. I don't think it's rationally warranted, obviously. Um, but it, it, using his usages, if somebody says there are no gods, they are impossible. I let's say they assume that they have proven that gods are impossible, which obviously is not the case. But let's say as that angry atheist, I have logically proven gods cannot exist. There's nothing that it can change my mind. I am closed-minded to this, but I'm an atheist. According to Peter Bogosian, that person would not be an atheist, <laughs> right? Am I missing something here? Kimamaki, give me feedback here. Am I missing something here? Am I, am I not correct on this? If, you're, you, if you adopted Peter Bogosian's usages, then somebody who's inflexible and intransigent and will not change their position given more information, they would not be an atheist using this definition. Now, as far as insufficient evidence to warrant a belief in divine, that's, just, that's another claim. That's an entirely different claim. That's an evidential claim. That's not a claim about ontology. That's a claim about evidential things. If I say there's no evidence of this, that is a very separate claim to saying, I believe this to be false or I don't believe. Now, a rational agent might say, I don't believe God exists. Um, I hold that there is sufficient evidence. There isn't uh, you know, any, uh, much evidence. Okay, but you need to justify that claim, that secondary claim. You need a reason why you hold there's no evidence. Like if somebody said to me, hey, Steve, um, I don't believe that point nine 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 repeating equals one, and I say why, and they say, well, there's no evidence that there is. Well, yeah, there is. Go go look at a math book. Go take a math course. Now you're just wrong, Steve. There's no evidence for it. Okay, Sh demonstrate to me that the, how you think there's no evidence for it. Go show me a citation that from an academic math book to say that there is no evidence or no reason to believe point nine nine repeating equals one. That would be sufficient evidence. You don't, you know. People can do that. People can say, how do you prove a negative? Well, there's, you know, the obviously uh, proof by impossibility, but I'm not asking them to do that. I'm just saying, give reasons for your position. And if you say there's no evidence of something, at least give something to, to solidify that, something to bolster it up, something to give a buttress to it. If you found a math book and the math book said, you know, this is like college level, grad school stuff, and it said, um, there is no proof that proves 0.99 repeating equals one, then you would have some credibility. Because then you could justify saying there's no evidence of 0.99 repeating equals one. Right? You, you've, you've literally have justified your claim. Will that ever happen? No. Absolutely will not happen because 0.99 repeating uh, equals one is a tautology. It's a metaphysical and logical necessity. It must be true in all possible worlds. But you see the point that I'm trying to make here? I'm, see, I'm, so, I'm saying that if somebody claims there's no evidence, you can justify that. Or you have at least an onus to it in a, in a discussion. You can't just arbitrarily say there's no evidence for something. And it certainly has no relation to the ontological status of God exists. Whether there's evidence or not has no bearing on your belief. You can believe something that has no evidence and may not be justified, but you can still believe it. And it may not even be wrong to do so. You can have irrational beliefs. I believe reality is real. That's a, a properly basic belief. I have no justification to believe that. I just take it as a presupposition. 
um, the Hume's problem of induction. You can't even justify believing induction will work day to day because that requires using induction, which is circular. So my belief that induction will continue to work day after day is non-justified. It's non doxastically infer, infer it's, it's not able to be doxastically inferred. You cannot derive it from anything. Right? I can't, I, can't, I can't derive that, the justification to believe induction will continue to work because the very act of doing so involves induction, which is circular. That's the whole basis behind Hume's problem of induction. But I still believe it works. I still believe it'll work tomorrow. Well, somebody says, well, how do you justify that? I don't. That's not rational. No, no, it's irrational. Remember, in order to be rational, you must justify. But just because you don't justify it doesn't mean it's necessarily irrational. And let me repeat that. To be rational, it needs to be justified. But just because it is not justified does not mean that it is irrational. It could be irrational. Irrational and irrational both are unjustified. So you can have an irrational position, meaning that it's not justified, but you know, you still have it. That's what a whole properly basic belief is. That's what a hinge commitment at Wittgenstein would, would be considered to be irrational. These are hinge commitments that you must have in order to be functioning in society and to be rational and to have linguistic communications between people. You have these hinge commitments. Uh, or if you, if you really want to use a term to freak people out, faith-based commitments. Um, so we all have faith-based commitments. But I know a lot of people hate that word faith. Peter Bogosian hates that word faith. But that's what it is, faith-based commitments. Um, Maki says, Bogosian approach relies too heavily on a non-nuanced application of Clifford's principle translated in Carl Sagan's idea about evidence. Absolutely agree with that, 100%. Um, I do not hold Clifford's principle. Um, I think that it can be really quite easily shown that Clifford's, prin Clifford, Clifford, <laughs> Clifford's principle does not really hold all the time, uh, which is basically, you know, uh, that no one should believe anything without sufficient reason, warrant, justification, things of that nature, right? Um, and, that, and by the way, Clifford's principle was more of a moral principle than some kind of norm, normal, um, um, normative principle. It wasn't even an epistemic principle. Clifford's principle was a, a principle about morality because he felt it was immoral to believe something without sufficient reason, even if that wasn't the case, because that was you know, based upon a ship that, and it literally did happen to him. This actually was something that happened with Clifford, that he went on a ship and it just started to sink. But um, the, the idea behind it is, if you believe that a ship is not seaworthy and you let that ship go out to sea and cross you know, the Atlantic, even if the ship makes it, you have done an immoral act. Even though there was no harm, no foul, you had a belief that it was you know, not seaworthy, right? So is it relating to morality? Um, and then he says, the atheist does not claim no matter how solid the evidence for supernatural creator, I refuse to believe. Well, some may, but as, well, he's right. That has nothing to do with atheism. Uh, and then he goes on to say, agnostics profess to not know whether there is an undetectable metaphysical entity that created the universe. Agnostics think there is not enough evidence to warrant believe in God, but because it is logically possible, they remain unsure of God's existence. There's a lot to work with there. A lot to work there and parse out. And I really don't want to freaking do it, to be honest with you. So I'm just going to sum, just do a quick summation of this. Um, it would make sense that agnostics don't feel there's sufficient evidence one way or another. I, I get that. But that's actually called evidential agnosticism in the literature. Um, and also, an agnostic genuinely would be willing to revise their belief, give enough evidence. But that doesn't entail that. Just because I have no position either way doesn't mean that I have any obligation to modify my belief one way or another given evidence. They're completely different concepts. And so, and, and again, it has nothing to do with knowledge. This is talking about the ontological status of God. Not having the ability to know or not is irrelevant. Again, that is one usage of agnosticism, but that's not in the ontological domain. That's not the psychological state of being an agnostic. So as an agnostic, I don't profess whether to know or not. It's more, I profess, I cannot decide whether God exists or God does not exist. That's what it is. That's what is used in the literature in modern day. Which obviously would entail you don't know, right? Because in order to know something, you first have to have a belief. 
Agnostics have no belief either way. Therefore, they cannot hold a knowledge claim either way. That is true. That would be an entailment. If I say, I do not believe God exists, and I do not believe God does not exist, that, of course, entails I have no knowledge claim either way. But that's irrelevant. So what? Um, and I don't care about this. I don't care about this. Uh, and this is the telling part. He says, <clears throat> I dislike terms like agnostic and agnosticism. Okay. Um, I advise street epistemologists to not use these terms. Well, you're being dishonest now. Sorry, Peter. I think you're intellectually dishonest in this particular aspect. I like Peter for other things, but this is dishonest, straight up dishonest. And let me, t let me, let me show you why. He says, this is why. I don't believe Santa Claus is a real person who flies around in a sled red, led by reindeer delivering presents. I am a Santa Claus atheist. All right, let me ask my live chat. Do you think for a second that Peter Bogosian merely lacks a belief in Santa Claus? Do you think that he's agnostic on it? Meaning, meaning that he doesn't have belief either way? Because if he doesn't believe, he can't know. So he's not professing any knowledge claims, but he's also professing he has no belief claims. Well, that's... Come on. We all can, I think, as rational people, probably be justified to say Peter Bogosian believes there's no such being as Santa Claus. He believes there is no Santa Claus. Uh, again, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth here, but do you really think that Peter Bogosian has no position on the proposition Santa Claus does exist or Santa Claus does not exist? Really? Because I don't buy that for a second. If you ask Peter Bogosian, does God um, exist? He'll probably say no. If you say, does God not exist? Or is, is it the case that God does not exist? Um, he'd probably say yes. If he was being honest in a dialogue. So it's, he, he's not properly expressing these things in a positive status because he's trying to water it down. And he's merely making it into I don't believe. But we all... Oh, we all kind of, come on. Is there anybody, let me ask the live chat. Is there any of you right now who are undecided whether Santa Claus exists or not? Any of you? Tell me, tell me, if, if push one of you decided that Santa Claus exists or does not exist. I don't care which way. And press two if you are undecided and don't have a belief the other way. I've decided there is no such thing as Santa Claus, which means I don't believe Santa Claus exists. But I've made a decision. He goes on to say, if, even though there's nothing logically impossible about this phenomenon, which is true, um, I'm not a Santa Claus agnostic. Yes, you are, Peter. Agnostic is the position uh, you don't have a belief either way. That's what it is. That is, a large man in a red suit delivering presents of the spirit of light is not a logical contradiction. That's true. It's a nomological problem. It violates laws of physics, which is nomological, but it's not a logical contradiction. Agnostic and agnosticism are unnecessary terms. Street epistemology should avoid them. Well, I think you're full of crap there, Peter. They are not unnecessary terms. They have a very necessary usage, which is the position of uncert uh, uh, not uncertain, uh, undecided. You're trying to dishonestly assume agnostics into an atheist by taking two-thirds of the pie of that epistemic space. So it is not unnecessary. It is necessary, well, local, I wouldn't say necessary, because that's modal, but it is certainly useful and axiologically valuable to have a separate position and name for that separate position of those people who are undecided. And that is called agnostic. Right? Okay. And then if you go to, this was, a, this was that... Um, Encyclopedia Britannica reference that was in Wikipedia, uh, Rational Wiki. Um, if you go down here and you look at ag agnostics, it's kind of funny. Um, it says, oh, I just lost it. Here. Um, that wasn't it. Yeah. Let me read this for you. To say that atheism is the denial of God or gods, and that is the opposite of theism, a system of belief that affirms the reality of God and seeks to demonstrate his existence. Um, uh, oh, this goes into the, um, the uh, some other views there. That's not what I want. Um, 
Because there are other forms of denial, that's true, but... Um, uh, where did it talk... Here, right here. Um, no, that's not it either. Because I don't agree with this. Agnosticism... says atheism is also distinguished from agnosticism, which leaves open the question of whether there is a God or not, professing to find the question unanswered or unanswerable. Yeah, but that's in a different domain of discourse. Again, that is not the understanding of agnosticism in the ontological domain. But where does, there was something in here I want to point out. Uh, I just had it, and I scrolled up to the top to show you this from Encyclopedia to Britannica, and I lost it. Uh, uh, here, right here. No. Uh, I don't think I can find it again. Now, Encyclopedia Britannica is, by the way, it, it incorporates all these different usages. Um, oh, here we go. Agnosticism has a parallel development of that of atheism. Agnostic, like an atheist, asserts either that he does not know God exists, or more typically, that he cannot know or have sound reason for believing that God exists. But unlike the atheist, he does not think that he is justified in saying God is, exists, or strong still, that kind of God can exist. Simultaneously, similarly, while some contemporary atheists say that the concept of God in developed theism does not make sense, and that is, uh, that's not what I wanted, because um, this is partly true um, in some ways. And again, in the epistemological domain, this is true, but again, it's not the ontolog ontological domain that I'm trying to find, um, because this part is true. The atheist does not think he's justified. That in the, unlike the atheist, he does not think he is justified in saying that God does not exist, right? Right? That's the important part of this part. That the athe unlike the atheist, he does not think that he is justified in saying God does not exist, meaning that atheism is, is the belief that God does not exist. Uh, Chris Foster for $9.99. Thank you for the super chat, Chris. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm working here. I'm working hard to, to show you guys this, and I appreciate the donations. Um, he says, Steve, I've said this before and I'll die saying it again, or saying it. You've changed the way I think as an atheist. You've helped my arguments gain more depth and honesty. Thank you, my friend. And I tell you, that is the greatest thing I can hear. Super chat or no super chat, that dude just, just is the reason why I do this. That, that is the fundamental reason. It's not for, you know, getting super chats. It's not for the ego boost. Uh, it is for the fact that if I can change people's minds to where they become better at something, that's awesome. And I do think that the way I describe these things makes atheists better atheists. Um, I think that Matt Dillahunty maybe started off with good intent, but he has gotten to the point where he has just now been a hindrance to atheism. Uh, it's all about his ego now. It's all, believe me, or you're wrong, and I hang up on you. Uh, he's gone. He's gone from you know as somebody who believes God. You know, matter of fact, if you go look at the old atheist experiences. He says he's a positive atheist in the sense that there is no God. He affirms the claim that God does not exist. He has said this on the atheist experience. And then later on kind of moves away from that because he doesn't want to have the burden of proof on that, which he knows does exist. And he's dishonestly trying to adopt the new atheist approach to atheism, which is the Anthony Flew, the George Smith, the, the Bolivants, the um, Michael Martin's approach the Peter Bogosian's approach. He's trying to adopt all that, even though it is atypical and it is, as Draper would say, radically departing from the norm. So, Chris, thank you for that. That, that really means a lot to me. Um, I know there's a lot of atheists who come back to me and say, damn, dude, you were right on this. I did read the literature. Same reasoning behind when I started this video. Today, he's talking about Wayne Fillmore. He went and he go... He went, and he went and go read the literature. When he read the literature, he said, damn, Steve, you're right. Mac revolution is a thing. I'm leaving young Cutherationism. Maybe people that will do that with the atheist experience. When people realize that the atheist experience and Matt Dillahunty and the host of the atheist experience are now all about ego and not about solid epistemic principles, not about good philosophy, not about critical thinking, not about promoting good logic. They're all about... Theists calling up, making idiots, them look like idiots, hang up on them, and then get donations for their, um, their group. That's all it's about. 
That is all that's about, to make money and to promote ego. Two things that I'm not about. Does the money help? Yes, absolutely. I appreciate it very much so. I'm not, not ever going to, to say that I don't appreciate every dime that I get. I do. Um, could you use more of it? Yeah, absolutely. But who couldn't? Um, but it means more to me when somebody says something like Chris just said. Um, and if, if people stop promoting groups like the Atheist Experience and said, you know what? We're atheists. We're going to go our own way. And we're going to promote atheism as the belief that God does not exist. And we're going to explain to theists why they're wrong. I think they're going to go farther. I think they're going to go further. I really do. But anyways, that's the second people with Tanita. Um, this tells you, uh, I, I'm going to wrap this up because it's very, very hot in here. And I got to turn the AC on and I'm dying. So give me about five more minutes. I'm going to wrap this up. But if you go look on George Smith's bio here on the Wikipedia, um, he says, it says, Smith grew up in Tucson, Arizona and attended University of Arizona for several years before leaving without a degree. He relocated to Los Angeles during 1971, and with the help of Libertarian editor Rory Childs Jr., he secured a contract from Nash Publishing, then located Los Angeles to produce a book on atheism. The finished book, finished product was his book, Atheism, The Case Against God. Again, that was three years after he left college. This was not a book to be taken seriously by philosophers. It was pop philosophy. Christopher Green says, hit the nail on the head, Steve. That's exactly what's going on with the AXP. Yeah, exactly what's going on with the AXP. I am sorry, but I, I loathe the AXP. The AXP is the antithesis of critical thinking. They are crapola. I don't watch the show. I have never watched the show in years. Um, I watch little clips, and people send me clips, but I, have n I don't think I've watched a live show for... Pff, I can't remember. Um, I would never give a dime to the AXP. Nobody should give a dime to the AXP. And... If you notice, all of them sound alike. It has become very cult-like. And again, you got to remember that Matt Delahunty also was promoting Atheism Plus. It was all about social justice until he was a victim of it. Hell, they kicked him off the his, his, they kicked him off the free thought blogs. Who promotes you know free free thought blogs is supposed to promote free thought, and they kicked off Matt Delahunty. How ironic is that? It's a whole different video. If you guys don't know that story, but yes, I'm sorry. Uh, AXP, Atheist Experience, you guys have gone far extreme. You guys are ideologues. You guys are basic dogmatists. Uh, you don't promote good philosophy. You don't promote good critical thinking. And atheists are waking up to it. Atheists are getting smarter. And the atheists have watched this channel and they listen to people like um, Answers or groups like Answers and Reason with Joe and Dave. They listen to Real Anthology with Blake um, Speed Watch and Ben. Um, and Ozzy and other people, they're becoming much better debaters as well. And they're certainly becoming far more literate on these topics. I just watched something not too long ago with Capturing Christianity. Um, they had Maje Majesty of Reason on before, where I'm pretty sure I've had on my show. And it's so funny because Majesty of Reason was promoting all my talking points. This was in 2021. And he actually mentioned a collapse, a semantic type of collapse, which was like four months after I put out my short form. So, did he give me credit? No, but whatever. It's okay. People can use my work. Um, but Christopher says, same. I tried watching one yesterday because it featured a guy who lives in my city, but I just couldn't get past the first five minutes. Yeah, they're all crap. It's the same crap over and over and over again. Now, people can say that's about mine. Okay, fine. But you know what? At least I'm entertaining, and I at least put out good information, and people learn from it. And by the way, this is really kind of new. I haven't done anything explicit and explicit atheism before, so this video is completely new on the topics that I talked about. I didn't really dive into explicit and implicit before. I've talked about weak and strong, but not explicit and implicit to this degree. Um, Chris says, AXP level 1 to 20, atheism. Harrison Hitchens, 20 to 50, atheism. And Oppie and McRae, 50 to 100. Appreciate that. Uh, don't forget uh, Mackie. Don't forget uh, McCormick. Don't forget Draper. Don't forget um, uh, Bugess Jackson, who's not even an atheist. He's actually a theist. Uh, but uh, by the way, Secular Outpost was um, interviewing Draper today. I have to watch that. All right, moving on here. I, I, gotta, I really do got to wrap this up. I uh, don't want to go there. Um, check out Marion Webster when you get a chance um, on this. Secular 
atheist and agnostic. It was pretty interesting. I found this. I hadn't seen it before, but it says, because people always quote Merriam Webster, right? They always say, oh, look at Merriam Webster. It says atheism is lack of belief God exists. But it's really telling because it says, though atheist and agnostic are words that are often used together and cited or cited in a similar context, they do not mean the same thing. Agnostic comes from the word meaning a known or a knowable or a not or without a gnosis meaning known. That's not necessarily the case, but we'll, we'll let it pass again. That, those are the those are the etymological roots, but that's not where the word actually came from. The crane it came from a neologism, right? With using certain roots, but those roots were not even the Greek root uh, gnosis or nostos. It was actually nos, which meant the illusion of having knowledge. But anyways, it means a person who does not have a definitive belief about whether God exists or does not ex or, or or not. More more broadly, a person who does not believe or is unsure of something. Yeah, a person who does not have a definitive belief about whether God exists or not. Boom, right there, agnostic. In Mary Webster, eat me people, eat me. Because they're like, oh, agnostic means knowledge. No, it doesn't, that's, that's not what it's saying. And by the way, again, this is very, very generalized. They don't get into specificities because that's not where agnostic came from. But again, agnostic, a person who does not have a defined belief about whether God exists or not. Anyway, guys, uh, I think that's about it. Um, uh, if you want to go check out Agnostics by, Ray, by, by Robert Flint, I, I, uh, you can go that, check that out because this actually is where he talks about um, Nos being the illusion of having knowledge. That's the reason why uh, Huxley created it. And also it was created as a norm normative epistemic principle. So when Flint starts talking about agnosticism, he is not talking about modern agnosticism. He's not talking about the psychological state of being agnostic. When Flint talks about agnosticism, he's, in his day, it meant a normative epistemic principle so there were years ago there's some idiot that thought that he refuted me by quoting robert flint from 1903 a hundred years ago quite literally almost a hundred years years ago thinking he defeated my argument not realizing that if you can did the contextualization of the time period and did an internal critique and eisegesis then he was referring to agnosticism as a normative epistemic principle and then a real quick neg um, negative and explicit atheism Wikipedia um, is really interesting because if you go there, and I'm going to wrap this up in two minutes, uh, uh, Euler diagram, is, yes, it's been out Euler, not Euler, Euler. An Euler diagram is just showing the relationship between weak and strong atheism and explicit and explicit atheism. Strong atheism is always explicit. I agree. And implicit atheism is always weak. Not so much. Weak is always going to be the subset. Explicit atheism can be either weak or strong, but this even shows that weak and strong atheism are not subsets of explicit, as Matt Dillon had said in one of the um, atheist experiences the other day, where he said, weak and strong are in the realm of explicit atheism. No, they are not. I mean, again, using an internal critique of Smith's model, it was not used that way. Because weak atheism is always going to be the superset because it's the larger of the sets. And with that, guys, I thank you. Thank you for the super chat. If you want to leave a super chat after, it's called um, um, a thank you. Uh, I have that enabled now. Uh, if you read, if you put a comment, you can leave a thank you, which is a donation to the channel. Uh, if you do that, I will be happy to read it out next and, and talk about it. Uh, so I appreciate all the thank yous. Uh, I have gotten one so far. Um, uh, but I forgot what it was. I have to read it out next. I did get a thank you, um, and, I, and but it was it was it didn't leave much of a comment. Uh, but uh, I think it was like good video or something. But I I apologize. I'm gonna find out who that was. and I'll do it next video. But I guarantee it. If you if you put a thank you uh, and you donate to the channel, I will I will make sure that you get proper credit. Um, but with that, guys, I got to turn the AC on. I'm freaking dying here. It is hey Alexa, how hot is it? Day. Expect a high of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. 110 degrees, people! I'm gonna choke you, Steve. <laughs> I gotta go! I gotta go! She's gonna kill me! She's gonna kill me! Good night!